excreta? Human waste. Shit. <laughs> Has been the bane of humankind from the beginnings of time. When we were roaming around as nomads many million years ago, this wasn't a problem. We dropped it where we were, we went away, and when we returned some months later, Mother Nature had taken care of the problem. But we're naturally gregarious. So we started getting together to start living in communities. Those communities turned into permanent settlements. Then we had little villages. Villages became towns. Towns became cities. And at that point, this became a really significant problem. Because an inability to deal with human waste meant that we had a high disease burden in our towns and cities and villages. That disease burden got really extreme in certain cases and we had loss of life of thousands, millions of people, as we saw in the first industrial revolution with the beginning of city slums. But about two and a half thousand years ago, human beings being as ingenious as they are came up with an ingenious solution. And that solution was, can we organize to drop this human waste into a channel or a pipeline, take it far, far away, so that we don't have to see it, we don't have to smell it, we don't have to hear it, and it can be quietly disposed of. And indeed, that became the basis of what we now have as the modern sewerage system. There is a problem, though. The problem is there's a huge cost attached to the system. And currently, that cost is covered by the public service and it's become one of the biggest public service cost sinks in human history. My name is Desi Naidu and I want to take you on a short journey around examining whether or not we can organize for this human waste to become the center of a successful worldwide industry and even a catalyst for a low carbon sustainable development economy. In other words, can we create a globally successful shitty business? <laughs> now, we live in a wonderful age. Many people call this the new golden age. We have access to technology and to science like we have never had before. It's unbelievable. What you do here in my king, as you are doing it now, is being seen all over the world. It's remarkable. The Internet of Things is organized for us not just to get the streaming of what is happening, but already somebody is commenting on what is being said here. We live in an age where some of us in this room have devices inside us like nanobots that are actually control controlling many important systems in our bodies to keep us healthy all the time. It is a wonderful, wonderful age. And one of the phenomena that has come out of this age is the concept of the unicorn. What is a unicorn? A unicorn is a startup company, that means a company starting from nothing at all, that organizes itself to get into a revenue base of more than $1 billion a year in a very short space of time. It's phenomenal. And it's called a unicorn because it's somewhere between the realms of reality and fantasy, because no one actually still believes that this can happen. But you know those, these companies because you use them every day. You use Facebook, you use Flipkart, you use Uber, you use Xiaomi. And this independent, strange, and isolated phenomenon over time has mushroomed. In fact, it has become a really crowded space in the modern world. And what's even more interesting than that is that all the newcomers of these unicorns are finding themselves coming out not of the developed world, not of Europe, not of North America, but from the developing world. Currently, primarily India and China, but hopefully soon Africa as well. So the challenge that we're talking about is can we create the world's first sanitation unicorn, or as I like to call it, a sanicorn. Is there a business case for this? Well, a couple of people are talking about it. The couple of people are you and I, of course, and the couple of people are also the folk on the screen who are a little more extraordinary than you and I, and that's Bill Gates and our own president, President Cyril Ramaphosa. So what are the core elements of the business case? Well, I think the first thing that we have to get to 
is as ingenious as the solution was two and a half thousand years ago. In the modern day, it's not doing the trick. As we sit here today, we are all gunning after this magical thing called the Sustainable Development Goals. And the Sustainable Development Goal for Sanitation is that every single person on the planet in 2030 will have access to improved safe sanitation wherever they are in the world. Our current deficit is that there are 2.2 billion people in the world currently that don't have access to this vital, vital service. And if we translate that into the numbers from UNESCO, we're talking about four and a half billion households, that four and a half billion people in the world that don't have a toilet in their close vicinity. What this constitutes is a major challenge, but what it also constitutes is a major market. So the first point of the business case is that a service is required in the sanitation domain to service these 4.5 billion people all over the world. However, it still organizes itself in a way that has to be different from before. So what has happened is that many organizations, my own, the Water Research Commission, many partners around the world have gathered under the banner of a reinvent the toilet program. This is run by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. These are bunches of scientists and technologists and engineers and financial modelers and a whole range of design folk that have put their minds into the challenge of this problem. And they've come up with some really, really ingenious solutions. So the first big problem that we have around organizing to expand the space into the SDG um, ambition is that most of the people that now need the service are either in very crowded, very dense, peri-urban areas and slums where there is no infrastructure on the one hand, and then on the other hand are in remote villages where the extension of that supply becomes very, very expensive. So there's an infrastructure problem, there's a cost problem, but there is one more that all of you know very well coming from this country. There is a global water problem. And water is in fact a huge problem, not only in South Africa, but all around the world. So these new solutions that are coming out are starting to engage this issue in a very compelling way. And I want to talk about one of them. I want to talk about this one because it is a South African invasion invention of which you should be really proud. It is called the Aram Lu. It's called the Aram Lu because it's shaped like an Aram lily. And for those of you who are more local than that, it's called a fark blom. Now, the key thing about this is learning from nature. In a toilet, water moves down in a straight line. So in order to remove the waste in your toilet every day, you need a minimum of six liters because of this design. And in general, it's between six and nine liters. This is a lot of water. It in fact is 30% of the household use of water for you and I in most cases. Now what the Aram Lu does, it says, but how does this work in nature? In nature, water does not move in a straight line. It moves in a vortex, in a spiral. And when you're moving the water in a spiral, you can already see that you're gonna need a lot less of it as you go along. To the point where we have working demonstrators of the Aram Lu now that use half a liter per flush as compared to six to nine liters. And with the advances that we have in materials technology to make the surface more and more smooth, we can actually get down to a quarter liter, which is absolutely remarkable. But this issue that we're talking about around the water also talks about what the global aspect of this is. So on the front end around having these new systems, we have the potential, the Gates Foundation has concluded, to in fact have an industry in the world that is worth more than $8 billion as we currently stand. Now I'm not going to go through the specifics for, from all over the world, we will do that at another time, but here's the thing. We are saying that we put new front ends on this for the poor people in the world, we are still gonna have as our major client the public sector. And the public sector, as we know, needs to generate a lot more money for them to do the very basic things that they need to do. So where will the other money come from? Well, the money comes from the back end. 
Because one of the coolest things about the system is how the waste is pro processed. It no longer needs to be in a conveyance system moving it miles and miles away from where you are. It can be treated exactly where you are in a localized environment. But more than that, it has some amazing byproducts in the way we treat the waste. So, the first value proposition that comes out of this is energy. There's a lot of energy in your poop. You probably didn't realize that. So you should value yourself. Now, at the simplest level, if we organize to pyrolyze it where it is, we have biochar. And biochar is transportable energy from one place or another, and you can use it, and people already do. A second one, though, in a more sophisticated way, is to collect the biogas. In the way you treat your waste, if you put certain very clever bacteria inside it, you can produce some very clean fuel in the form of biogas. Biogas can be used exactly where it is, and we have communities around this country and demonstrators that are already using their biogas as the sole means of energy in some villages. Or you can compress it and store it and transport it to wherever you want. But we can get even more sophisticated than that. We have some folk, <coughs> led by the University of Columbia, that have organized to demonstrate this in Accra in Ghana. So this is not a first world thing, it's very much a developing world thing, where they're extracting the fats and oils from human excreta to be used and made into biodiesel. And it is a very, very viable prospect. So can you imagine a situation where you're taking a flight from one place to another, and your carbon cost is completely offset by the fact that you're using on that flight biodiesel from your own poop to make that plane get from one place to another. So this is what is currently possible. And the energy alone will organize for us to immediately ramp ourselves up into the realm of organizing not only for a sanitation revolution, but to make the sanicorn much more viable. Now, we also need to examine a few other issues associated with this. So the one value proposition is the energy, and the energy value proposition is really sound. The second is even more sophisticated than that, because we are amazing bioreactors, because that's what human beings are. We take stuff in, we do wonderful things with them inside, we use a lot of what we, we, we take in, which is good, and the stuff that comes out of us has very particular value adds. So if we organize ourselves to take out the high value chemicals from our own waste, we have a variety of uses. And this is not just theoretical. We have demonstrator plants in this country, all over this continent, and indeed all over the world that are already working on this issue at pilot scale. It's not beyond the laboratories. And the nature of the sophistication associated with this is absolutely remarkable. So let me talk to you firstly about the thing that will possibly make you cringe. Inside your poop is an incredible amount of high value proteins. One of the things you can do with the proteins, of course, is you can recycle those proteins and put it back into the nutritional cycle. Now, I knew that would make you cringe. But let me make you cringe further and say that although we're not doing that yet, right here in this country, we're doing something very close to it. In our black soldier fly experiments, we are pulling out the protein using the black soldier fly and using those proteins in the form of the larvae of those black soldier flies to make fish meal in our aquaculture. So it's already part of the nutritional cycle. But that's not where most of the money is going to come from. Most of the money that comes out of the protein from your poop is actually going to go into industrial uses because industry is pretty advanced nowadays. And protein has become part of the organic, inorganic interface and has a variety of uses in your daily lives, either in the form of the whole protein or in the form of long chain and short chain dipeptides and multiple long peptides in the system. There are certain brands of hair shampoo 
which you probably use this morning, that has a fair amount of protein products in it already. So when they're advertising this thing and saying protein enriched, it's not just advertising, it really is protein. So industry has a large use for protein sources, and this is another place where it can go. But it does not stop there. So if you move to the other class of things in this chemistry scale and look at the lipids, there are certain characteristics of the lipids that come out of your excreta that make it very, very viable for certain uses at the upper end of the scale. As we, sp as we speak, a very famous brand, and I'm not allowed to mention the name, is already experimenting with using the lipids from human excreta as coverings, hydrophobic coverings on adventure garments. And it is quite phenomenal. Because with the layer of these lipids on those garments, it makes them completely waterproof. And it allows very, very fluid, few fluids in. So you don't only get the waterproof part of the concept, but you also get the insulation. So at some point in the future, you may be able to take a walk in Antarctica using only this light jacket. I wouldn't recommend it, but this is what is possible. And out of this is the possibility of an incredible industry. So the proteins and lipids may be one of the aspects that takes our SANICON from the $1 billion range to the $100 billion range in a very short space of time. Because there is indeed gold in that poop. So we become miners of a completely different sort going into the future. So colleagues, I hope I've been able to convince you that if we take a very different look at what we currently consider a huge cost burden to the system, we will, one, organize to solve the problem of the access to sanitation and maybe even be able to meet our SDG goals in a very smart way. We will also be organizing for us to get rid of all the current inhibitors that are barriers around our conventional sewerage systems, particularly in peri-urban slums, as well as in remote villages. But even more than that, in the way we do it, because we're not using all of that water, we'll organize ourselves to be more water-wise, because we're not using all of that energy to move the waste from one place to another, we will also be organizing for a low-carbon economy, because we're switching from the fossil fuels to biodiesel that you're actually producing, you're organizing for a low-carbon economy, and all of this is starting to look really, really attractive. But, you may ask, what happens if we manage to do all these wonderful things so that we create these global industries that organize for us to make billions and billions and billions of dollars while bringing down the carbon budget, which is excellent, and organizing for servicing of all of the people in the world in a much smarter way. What if we create this dependency on this new industry and we run out of the feedstock? God forbid. Well, I'm not so sure about that. There are about 7.25 billion of us on the planet right now, give or take. And we're producing, because we're active producers, of something between 200 and 600 grams of this every single day. And the 200 and 600 depends on lifestyle, and it depends on diet. And given that our diets are bad, and our lifestyle is worse, we're closer to the 600 rather than the 200, we've got 3 billion kilograms of this stuff on the production line every single day. I am not terribly sure that we're going to have a problem in this particular direction. <laughs> Much more than that, we can start customizing. Now, you're going to cringe even further. Because what you get out depends on what you put in. So if you want a particular kind of product, well, you've got to feed the person the right kind of thing. I was, in fact, as a student, the subject of an experiment with this, with a thing called oxalate. And they asked me to eat a kilogram of chocolate. At the beginning, it sounded like a great idea. But if anyone has tried to eat, eat a whole kilogram of chocolate, it gets a bit diff difficult towards the end. So this is not something new. We've been doing this for a long time. So colleagues, in conclusion, the question I have to ask you is, are you ready to become part of the team to take on this challenge. Yes. <laughs> Can we do it from here in Africa?
Can we do it, Premier, from here in my UK? Yes. So my invitation to you is let's start this journey to move from the stink, which is currently a burdensome public service cost sink, and turn ourselves to creating an industry whose balance sheet will organize for everyone to blink and at the same time provide an incredible case study for a low carbon, sustainable development model in the world that will cause everybody to stop and think. I thank you.